every day, wisdom's crying out in the streets. You know that? Now the world goes on, rushing on its way, unfortunately, down the broad road without even a chance to think about where they're going. It just keeps moving at a very heavy pace until it's too late. They open their eyes, they're going over the cliff into the pit. But if, it, if our job is like the prophet Daniel, just show the people what's going on in the world and point out, hey, that's scripture, that's prophecy. Let me just reemphasize something I shared before and then add a little detail. There is one piece of real estate on this earth, 35 acres, that is the very center, epicenter of the earth and of prophecy, and that is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The sages say rightly, the Jer Israel is the center of the world, the center of Israel is Jerusalem, the center of Jerusalem is the Temple Mount. And we have seen so many things happening on the Temple Mount, going back and forth, and to the carnal mind, this is just nothing, just Arabs, Jews fighting again, as they always do, just nothing to see here, move along. But to those who know the prophecies, this is of huge, huge import. And there's a world leader that stepped up to be the champion against Israel and on behalf of the Muslims and their false claim to the Temple Mount. And that is the president of Turkey, Erdogan. Let me say something. Turkey is very important in Bible prophecy. Turkey is very important to the Bible. Most of the New Testament was written to people living in what we call Turkey now. Seven letters to churches in Turkey. And one of those letters he said to the church of Pergamos, I know where you live, even where Satan's throne is. There's something very, very bad happened. So see, 75 or 80 or years ago, back in the 1920s it was, so almost 100 years ago now. Something wonderful happened to Turkey. I wish it would happen to all the Muslim world today. They got a new leader after World War I. They got shattered. They defeated. They're on the wrong side. And that new leader is, goes by the name Ataturk, although his, his uh, real name is Kemal Mustafa. But Ataturk means father of the Turks. And he looked at that backward country that used to be the Ottoman Empire and used to rule about a quarter of the globe and it was sick and it's corrupt and it's dead and it just got humiliated and he said I'm going to make it over again and what he did was put Islam on the sidelines pretty close to where it belongs as far as I'm concerned and I mean he shut down Islamic schools he forbid the, the wearing of burqas he took even the way the fezes which is a traditional Islamic headgear for Turkey he changed the language even to get as much Arabic out as he could and bring, bring it back to pre-Turkish language. He didn't ban Islam outright, but he put it on the side for about a hundred years. And guess what? In all the Muslim world, wouldn't you know it, Turkey became the most advanced nation, most westernized nation. The standard of living raised, education raised. The, he, it's like he, he, he removed the veil and just, in some sense, secularized the country. I'm all for secularism in the Muslim world. And he, they even rewrote the Constitution and they made it officially a secular country. Separation of mosque and state. And they appointed the army as the guardian of, separ of secularism. And the other thing they did, which most of the world mourns so deeply about, they haven't been able to get over it, is in 1922, he abolished something called the Caliphate, which was the central Sunni Muslim unifying body of jurisprudence and holy war, which was, happened to be in Constantinople. He just abolished it. And they've been mourning ever since. They want to get that caliphate back. Now that's just ancient history, isn't it? Someone says, why are you boring me with stuff that happened 100 years ago? Because before our eyes, every bit of that is being reversed. And Erdogan is going to be the champion of the Sunni world, the new caliph. 
He just had that fake coup a year ago about this time, which gave him the permission to purge the government and military of up to 200,000 people, putting many of them in prison, re-education camps, whatever. And he used to be pro-Israel and pro-Western, but now he's adamantly pro-Islamic uh, goals, Islamic terror, jihad. He's calling all the Muslims of the world to unite to take back the Temple Mount from the Jews. This is prophecy. Look, I won't, I won't take too much of your time, but you know, it's the country, Ezekiel, Togarma, Gomer, Magog, Gog, the house of Togarma. This is ancient names for Turkey and southern Russia, the Caucasian area, okay? So the Caucasians are in the, in the prophecy, all right? It's, it's they that are going to unite and come against Israel in the final war that God himself will intervene on. But it didn't look likely for a long time because Turkey was a completely secular nation. They, she, European Union was considering letting them in. Thank the Lord they didn't do it. That'd be suicide. Very close to, to Germany, very close to France. Actually, Erdogan's at the throat of Europe now because he has hordes of refugees stopped in Turkey from all over Africa, Syria, the Muslim world. And he makes the European Union give him 3 billion euros or else he'll just open up the spigot and flood him again. Open up the spigot and flood him again. <laughs> I'm telling you, our world's changing right before our eyes. But all that, oh, that, that wouldn't even concern me. I wouldn't be that much interested if it wasn't connected to the Bible and to the second coming of Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is coming. Hallelujah! <laughs> you see this stuff? And I thought that this is interesting too that... Um, Erdogan and Netanyahu have had a public argument. And Netanyahu snapped at Erdogan the other day. This isn't the Ottoman Empire. Well, it's not the Ottoman Empire, but it's going to morph into something even worse. The caliphate. The long-awaited caliphate. Which in the Muslim world, which one out of seven people in the world is Muslim and growing. And 80% of the Muslims are Sunnis. The rest are Shia and the various sects. And the Sunnis have not been united since 1922. And as long as there's no caliphate, then they're not required to do jihad. That's the big debate. People are saying, Osama bin Laden, you were premature. We don't have a caliphate. And you're already waging war on these infidels. You're going to get them mad before we have a central unifying authority. The debate raged in the Muslim world. But when you get that caliphate back, every Sunni is obligated to participate fully in jihad. Can you imagine that? One out of seven people in the world switched on. Already, they're already restlessly pulling at the leash. Do you not realize that with the events you see in Europe, the terror events all over the world? Terror events exploding. It used to be rare, now it's common. It's so common. Terror events that would have startled us aren't even reported too much because you can't remember them for the next one and the next one and the next one. It's the new normal. Jesus is coming back. Let me go to Romans chapter 10. I told you a few weeks ago that through much of the summer I wanted to go back to very simple things about salvation, about witnessing, and how to be an effective tool for Christ. And in that spirit, I'm going to give you another message along that line from Romans 10. And basically what I'm going to teach you, very important, I don't care how long you've been a Christian or how short you've been a Christian, this will apply to every single Christian in this room. And if you're not interested in it, that's a bad sign, okay? And that is how to lead a person to the Lord. How to lead a person to the Lord. Now, on the one hand, as I've told you before, we've never created a Christian before. 
Any Christian is an act of God. It's a miracle, right? So I don't want to sound contradictory then when I come around and give you a message on how to lead a peace person to the Lord. But the truth is, it pleases God to use Christians to press his truth, his gospel, to tell people of their need of the Savior. So I can't say, well, I woke him up. God woke him up, but God used me. And there is no greater joy that you can know as a Christian than to be instrumental in the salvation of a soul. You know how much a soul's worth? What shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? One person. He says there's rejoicing. Jesus said this, literally. There's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Do you get that? In the presence. In other words, he's not even saying the angels, although they rejoice. Who stands or sits on a throne in the presence of the angels of God but God himself? I'm telling you, listen, everybody, because the time is short. In the first place, there's nothing hidden that won't be brought to light. In the second place, not one word you speak in his name will fall to the ground. Have faith. Go out and share your faith. Not one word, not one deed that will be forgotten. Not one thing, not one prayer will be insignificant. All will be gathered up into a censer and cast to the earth as Revelation 8 reveals. And things are going to happen. There is not one singing of the Lord's Prayer in which we say, let thy kingdom come. That, not one of them is just a song. That's a prayer. Amen? Yeah. I'm doing better preaching than you're doing shouting. All right, brethren, now let me walk you through this very beautiful passage of Scripture because you need to be familiar with it, and it will make you ready. Familiarity with it will make you ready for those situations the Lord puts you in where you can help bring a person to what? To the saving knowledge of God. See, one, one thing I want to say right off the bat, knowledge, uh, salvation is to come into a knowledge Things I thought I knew, but I didn't know what I was talking about. And then he brought me into a knowledge. He says, God is not willing that any should perish, but what? But that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, let me just walk you through this. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them, he's talking about Israel here, is for their salvation. Let me stop right there. My heart's desire. Okay. You, you, if God has mercy on us, he'll wake us up. He'll fill us with the Holy Spirit. And one of the signs of that is he'll put it on your heart to long for someone's salvation. I'm telling you this is real and this is really important my heart's desire and prayer to God really that's what you prayed about Paul look at Romans 9 1 he's even stronger here he swears by the Holy Spirit I'm telling the truth in Christ I'm not lying my conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit three times over he swears why does Paul have to swear? We already believe him. He's the apostle of God, but three times over, because he's going to say something so powerful it's actually hard for me to imagine myself doing. That I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsman according to the flesh. <laughs> That's on another level there. He's actually saying, if I could trade places in damnation for my family, I'd do it. Of course, he can't do it. It's the same thing Moses said. God, he said, God said to Moses, leave me alone. Get out of my sight. I'm going to wipe them out and start all over with you. You know what Moses said? Oh, God, take me out of the book of life then. 
blot me out of the book of life. It's hard to fathom loving anyone so much. But I'll tell you one thing. If you love anyone at all, you love their soul. You really, really care about what's going to happen to them. Now, I can't say I do this. I, there's some people that come close, my kids, my wife. But wow, I don't think I can do it. It's too strong in me. I know there's a heaven to gain and hell to shun. I just can't do it. Well, he couldn't do it, and neither could Moses do it. But how many know we know someone that could do it, and he did do it, amen? Yeah. And that's one of the best things of all to remember, that Jesus Christ could do it and did do it. He took our judgment. He bore our sins. He took our place. It's... <laughs> How many years have I been sitting here? But it's still amazing to me. It's staggering. Now, the next verse, verse 2. He says, I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. I hear he brings this point up. Let me bring a simple point. Just because someone's zealous, that doesn't mean that they're all right. Zeal doesn't make up for anything. Jehovah's Witnesses are zealous. I've actually heard Christians say, I wish we were like Jehovah's Witnesses, because they're zealous. They go out and lock doors. I don't want to be like Jehovah's Witnesses. Not in any way. They are blinded by a false zeal, and they are working toward a false goal. And when they die and their eyes are opened up, they're going to find that all that zeal did is increase the judgment on them. So I want nothing to do with being like a Jehovah's Witness. You could have a zeal that is so fake, but you're so into it that it actually stands in the way of you becoming a Christian. I know people like that. They're zealous. They're into it, man. What are they into, though? Everything but the point. Oh, well, he makes this point. They have a zeal for God, but it's not according to knowledge. Their knowledge was extensive. I've talked about the Pharisees, especially. They memorized the first five books of the Bible. How'd they miss the point? <laughs> Salvation is coming into a knowledge. They did not know. That's what they thought they knew. Okay. They thought they knew, and they knew more than everyone else in the nation. And they didn't know a lot. But this mixed guided knowledge, the way Jesus put it, he said... If the light that's in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? What? Yes, they, they didn't know. They didn't know about God's righteousness. Are you kidding me? They were experts on righteousness. What's righteousness? Let's put it this way. What, what does God require? I mean, the Pharisees made it a lifelong study and passion. What does God require? And they broke down Scripture, and they, they didn't just stop with the Ten Commandments. They broke down every statute and every ordinance until they came down to a system of 613 commandments. This is what God requires, and this is what we dedicate our life to the fulfillment of. And man, they, they were serious. Tithing? Would you take salt out of your cupboard and divide it into ten so you gave your tenth of salt to the offering? Washing your hands? Those are laws for priests. Pharisee said, we're not taking any chances. Put those on us too. How many times in the Bible you see where they said, Jesus, you and your disciples don't wash your hands. Well, what do they mean by that? Of course they wash their hands. Yes, but not like a surgeon from the elbow down as a priest would. These people were devoted and their activities, the, the, the deeper they were into them, really, the truth is, the further they were from God, and they didn't know it. The great example is Paul. Now, let me just summarize this quickly, what they didn't know. What does God require? It comes down to this. You shall love the Lord your God with everything in your being. You shall love the Lord your God with 
everything that is within you, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And you should love your neighbor at least as much as you already love yourself. How do you get 613 commandments and then miss that? But they did. 613 commandments, that means your faith is in you. Your ability to know those commandments, your ability to keep those commandments, the confidence you have to keep them. I'll tell you what about what God requires. You shall love the Lord your God, Bill, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I look at that in honesty and go, oh, God, I can't, I don't. I fail. And I am truly sorry about that. I'm not glib about it. Oh, I wish I loved the Lord thy God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I wish I loved my neighbor. Well, we got a higher one. As much as Jesus loved me. It's certainly my goal, but man, do I ever fail. Well, congratulations. If you know that, you know more than the Pharisees. And you know, if you're a failure, that you need Jesus Christ. See? See how it works? People can't be saved because they don't know things. Even experts don't know things. After all, it is a revelation from God. They didn't know about God's righteousness. See, they thought they had a high view of God. The truth is they had a low view of God. They said, all right, now you tithe your salt, your pepper, your cumin, man, aren't we great? And you don't kill anyone and you don't commit adultery. And someone says, yes, but what if you have a filthy thought? Well, you didn't do it, did you? Nope. Then you're good with God. Just keep on going. And when Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount, which is basically the true interpretation of the law, according to the great and true rabbi who actually bequeathed the law to us from heaven. You think it means this? I'll tell you what it means. Man, when I read the Sermon on the Mount, it collapsed me. It just slew me right there. Anyway, they seek to establish their own. Well, they're really into works. And that is something to be proud of. Because they do so much, and they're so active. It's all about doing. That's what people say. It's all about doing. I'm a doer. Not, it's not about knowledge, it's about doing. So they go and establish their own righteousness. They don't realize it's their own righteousness. Now this is really important. See, I used to have a concept of righteousness. It was my own. I look at myself in comparison to other people, and I say, you know what? I, I, know, I know I'm not perfect, but I, I, at least I'm not like Charlie Manson. How I many you know that on the judgment day, you're not going to be compared to Charlie Manson? God has appointed a man by which he'll judge the world in righteousness. The standard is Jesus. Oh no. They establish their own righteousness. They don't subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Now this is an issue I want to really t explore here. In, in other words, they set up their own righteousness, which is right standing or justification of their own life. Everyone on earth does it, even if you're an atheist. Everyone has a concept of righteousness and whether they're a good person or not or justification of their life. Every one of them, but most are wrong. There is one and one only acceptable righteousness before God. And that is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, I, I'll share a, ver, uh, uh, a phrase with you that caught my attention early in my Christian life. I hate to admit it was on a bumper sticker, but every once in a while bumper stickers are right. They're like a broken clock. They can be right twice a day, all right? <laughs> now listen to this one, though. This issue of righteousness, what does God require? It says, the righteousness which he requires is the righteousness which his righteousness requires him to require. What's that mean? 
That means that being God, he can only accept absolute perfection. He can't, he can't say, well, you're a little filthy. Would you drink a Coke with just a little feces in it? That doesn't even properly illustrate this point. God's got a holy heaven, and only absolute holiness shall go there. Nothing less. And there can't be anything more. <laughs> Righteousness. See, I stumbled over this meaning. Maybe it was my good Catholic background, but righteousness, good goodness, good works. The saints, the halos, these were good people. They went about doing good, and they denied themselves, and they hurt themselves, and they lived in the desert, and they ate cold fish and all this other stuff. And they were good. They wouldn't be worldly. And so the whole goal is to get like that, or maybe by the end of your life you can get like that, or maybe after you sow your wild oats you can get like that. You hope for some kind of righteousness or through confession or through uh, penances, you can go back to the clean feeling you had as a child. Whole thing about righteousness, and I was I'm wrong about all of it. Righteousness means what he requires. Well, one day I found out from the book of Romans that righteousness has a secondary meaning based on this truth. What God requires, God provides. What he requires. God provides. Lord, I don't have a flawlessly clean garment for the marriage supper of the Lamb. What's he say back? I'm glad to hear you say that. I do. Righteousness is what he demands, and righteousness is right standing as a gift from heaven. That's the meaning, the deep meaning of the verse that converted me. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God. What God demands, God only can provide. But if you refuse that provision in a vain attempt to establish your own righteousness, then there is only one place for you, and that is banishment from all that is true and good and beautiful. So it's about righteousness. I think of the parable Jesus told. The parables are so beautiful. We've got to get back to those. Two men go to the temple to pray. One goes right up front, of course, and the other one stands at the back. One lifts up his face unto heaven in his hands. God, I thank you. Thank you for what? I thank you that I'm not like other people. I do tithe. I do fast. I keep the holy days. I give. I give to charity. He's thanking God for himself <laughs> and for his works. And Jesus said the other one wouldn't even so much as lift up his head. He smelled on his breast. You know what that means? The heart, the very seat of sin. God, have mercy on me. You know what it literally says in the Greek? Be propitiated. Be propitiated. Let me teach you. Some of you know it, but some of you don't. A legal term in the Bible, propitiation. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. What is propitiation? What is he praying when he says, God, be propitiated toward me, a sinner? Propitiation is a special kind of offering. It means a satisfaction offering. You owe something to God. You can't pay it. You're begging God. Is there some offering? 
that's been offered that can satisfy the broken law, the righteous wrath of God against me, a sinner. He beats his breast, the heart, the seed of sin. Have propitiation toward me, a sinner. The Bible says that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross is the propitiation. Look it up. There's many places. Romans 3, 1 John 2. He is the propitiation, not for our sins only. Wow, the sins of the whole world. What a tragedy that the world would go to hell when someone satisfied the claims against them. Righteous claims from a righteous God. He got the right. You owe. I owe. We can't pay. But we know the one that can Amen? Amen? So he says that uh, they wouldn't subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Now you see, there's the two meanings of righteousness here. The one is the, the, the just demands of God. They think they're subjecting themselves to that. And so they embark on a, 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 a lifestyle of works and they're subjecting themselves to the demands of the holy God, but they don't even understand those demands deep enough to realize that they've lost from the start. But there is the second kind of righteousness in this verse, and I think this is really important for all Christians to understand. Righteousness is right standing as a gift from above. There's a judgment coming. And the standard is absolute righteousness. And the problem is the human race doesn't have it, not one of us. But the gospel is, there is a gift based on the cross of Jesus wherein the Lord will bequeath and impute the perfect righteousness of Jesus. Remember the song? He is all my righteousness. I stand complete in him, and I worship him. Now let me move on here. Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness, which is based on the law, shall live by that righteousness. You know what that literally means? You want the law to justify you, then you must live by it. In other words, you can't do 99%, 100%. 100%. The man that will be justified by the law must live by it. 100% or nothing. Wait a minute. Before I even started, I already lost. I've been sinning ever since I was born. I can lie before I can talk. Well, then you may as well give up on that. Listen to Moses. Moses won't put you under law or works. Moses says, the man who practices the righteousness based on law shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks thus. Now he's quoting Deuteronomy 30. Don't say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will ascend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. What's he saying there? Moses predicted this. There is another righteousness, a gift from God. It's from heaven. Someone come up from the dead. What's the point? Can you get to heaven to get him? Could you bring him back from the dead? Well, who did? God. This is the other, this is one of our songs. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin left the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Am I going to go up and bring him back? No. <laughs> And nothing I can do could bring him down, or nothing I can do could bring him from the dead. But God raised Jesus from the dead. And God descended from heaven to save us. Amen? And Moses predicted it. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we're preaching. Oh, faith. Without faith, you can't please God. But those who come to God must believe that he is, and that he's the rewarder of those who seek him. Faith. You got to believe. Your belief has to be in your heart. And at some point, you got to make a confession with your mouth. This is why open baptism and stuff like that is so important. Why we don't do baptisms in a closet somewhere. You should stand up in front of a group of people like our dear, beautiful sister did last week and say, I want to follow Jesus Christ. I just about burst into tears when she did it. The 
beauty of the moment. He says, God's as close to you as your breath. Well, wait, I thought I'd do all these works and climb up the ladder to sainthood. Basically, Moses is saying, because of what the Messiah does, because of what Jesus did, God's as close to you as your breath. And then he goes on to say, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Isn't it simple? You ever taken anyone through that verse? It's beautiful. You sit down with someone and say, don't take my word for it. Look at what Paul the Apostle said. Look what Moses says. If you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord. And if you just believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart a man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. I just want to make a few more points here. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Are you kidding? That's too easy. That's what I thought at first when it was presented to me. There's got to be more to it than that. Really? Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart? What? But let's just take a look at this and break it down. First he says, For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. I want to stop and talk about that for a minute. How does believing in your heart turn you into a righteous person? Well, it has to do with the content of your belief. See, faith is all about content. Not about a feeling. Not about being positive. It's about truth. Just what is it that I came to believe in my heart? Well, before I look at that, let's just look at what the unbeliever whether they realize it or not, at the deepest core of their psychology, sinners believe some variation of the serpent's lie in the garden. You can be as God. Why do I say that? Well, what is sin? You just do it because you want to. Yeah, but it's against the rules. Oh, no, you make your own rules. Isn't that the core of what it means to be worldly? Isn't that the core of what it means to be lost? You actually believe on some level, whether it's ever pointed out to you or not, you actually believe on some level the serpent's lie. Yes, you can be as God. You can define yourself. You can be whatever you want. You do whatever you want, and you make your own laws. Don't go by anyone else's. Boy, if I wrote a book like that, it'd probably be a number one bestseller on Amazon, all right? There's so much hunger for that message. Be your own person. It's the serpent's lie. But we live our whole life that way. That's why we keep sitting. We want to do our own thing. But if you hear the gospel, you realize something on the same deep level if you truly believe. And that is that the gospel is actually the opposite of that principle. You can't be God. You could never be God. But God became a man. The belief that goes against the deepest core belief in all my worldliness and sin and independence came down to this. God became a man. I'm telling you, that belief, it changes everything. Might not be instant, but the adherence to that belief changes everything you think, everything you practice, affects everything. The way you see God, rightly or wrongly, affects everything. God, why did you have to come down? Remember what Moses said? Who's going to bring him down? Why did you have to come down from above to save me? Man, you were so lost. 
so bankrupt and so doomed. There is no other way you could be saved. God had to humble himself. You got to believe. With the heart of man believes, resulting in righteousness. You are what you believe. A lot of people's problem is not that they, they don't need 12 steps, they don't need counseling. They just need to quit believing that they're God. They go back to that. That's a start right there. I don't want to be a God anymore. I want to be a man under God. I want to worship God. Worship itself, true worship, will take care of 90% of your problems. This is like a GPS. You got to get everything in coordination. Now, let's see, where is God? Oh, God's above. <laughs> now, where am I? Well, I'm below. Oh, finally, you're getting yourself coordinated. You became a man? He came down. You had to become a man. I mean, if you embrace the incarnation, it's like an atom bomb that goes off in your soul. It just rearranges everything. Let me go on, because I didn't want to keep you too long, but with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. What's he saying there? Well, what is salvation? See, there's a lot of words for salvation, right? There's new creation, there's born again, there's justification, there's sanctification, all kinds of words, but usually we just resort to the one. Have you been saved yet? But each word, each word speaks to a specific aspect of our relationship to God and this world. On the day of Pentecost, Peter preached and said, repent and be baptized, calling on the name of Jesus, and save yourself from this world. Now he's talking about something specifically. Salvation is separation from this world. Come out. Noah and his family were saved when they went in the ark. Why? They just distinguished themselves from the doomed world. Dear sister and the one of the week before, they're saved from this world. Why? They stepped over the water line. What are they saying in their baptism? Oh, this whole world's doomed. Not a person's going to survive the judgment coming. But we want to call upon the name of the Lord and step over the line and be saved. See, what he's saying is, when you confess your faith, you distinguish yourself from the world. In a special, powerful way, you step aside. You keep doing that and you keep distinguishing yourself. Now, just one more. He says, uh, you got to believe. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. A church has developed creeds over the years, that, you know, and I love creeds. I mean, they're fantastic. Here, a whole room of people make a confession of faith. Some of those creeds are great. We believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth. I could go through the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, and it's beautiful to me, right? But what you're seeing in Romans 9, or 10, verse uh, 9, is the earliest creed. Why did they have to get more complex? Well, because they were fighting heresies. So, you know, every time a heresy rose up, they put another line in the creed to say, no, we're not the people who believe that. Okay. Jesus is God, but he's man, but he's in, undivided. You know, these creeds get complicated because the heresies complicate everything. And they want to find out who actually subscribes to the real, true, orthodox faith. Amen? But the earliest creed is very simple. Jesus is Lord, and God raised him from the dead. No, you can, well, I can unpack that. I could spend weeks unpacking that. What are you saying when you're saying Jesus is Lord? You're saying that Jesus is God. You can't be saved unless you say that. Jesus is the Lord of the Old Testament, the Yahweh. The Lord said to my Lord. What's in that? Well, it implies the Trinity. The incarnation, the doctrine of him coming down from him. What's the Lord doing down here? Well, he had to come down to save us. Remember Moses? Who's going to bring him down? Well, he's going to bring himself down. Who's going to bring him back from the dead? Well, he's going to have to do that. We can't do that. Then who's going to make man righteous? Well, it's all him. 
not a thing you can do. Except believe. And I want to close on this. Believe is more potent than mental assent. Someone says, I can agree to that. Jesus is Lord. George Washington was the first president. America is a capitalistic country. I can agree with all that. No, believing isn't that. That's called mental assent. Believing is entering into it in your heart. You mean God came down from heaven? That was God hanging on the cross? Christ crucified? Why did he have to die? See, that's implied in this. God rose him from the dead. Well, why did he die? <laughs> Man, he had to die as a substitute for your sins. When they went to embalm him, the tomb was empty. God rose him from the dead. What's the implications of that? If God rose him from the dead, God's going to raise you from the dead and me from the dead. In fact, God's already raising you from the dead. You're separate from the world. Resurrection's already happening. Look, immerse yourself in this. Sit down and take someone through it. Lead someone in prayer. Pray with them that they accept Jesus Christ as Lord. The time is short. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this church, for her hunger for God and love, truth, and willingness to follow you and not be afraid of the reproach of this world. Please bless us. Bless every member, every family, all of our children. Father, and we're part of the bigger church. I thank you for that. We're part of something bigger than we are. Let the church of God prevail in the last days, Lord. Let us finish the race strong. Yes. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.